Szanowni Państwo, witam Państwa bardzo. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome. My name is Piotr Buras. I represent the European Council on Foreign Relations and I have the great pleasure to invite you to our debate about the future of the international order. And I have the great pleasure of organizing this event together with the Embassy of Finland here in Poland. And it's the first time that we've organized an event together. But we are very happy to, to, to have done so. And I hope that we'll keep organizing uh, events together in the future. And before we start, I would like to ask Mr. Ambassador Juha Ottman to provide us with some introductory comments and one technical remark. This debate will take place in both Polish and English, so if you need um, interpretation, you can um, pick up the, the equipment and listen to the interpretation. The Ambassador of Finland to, to Poland and on behalf of the Embassy, a uh, warm welcome to this uh, debate on the policy brief on multilateralism that was uh, produced in collaboration with the Finnish Ministry for Foreign Affairs and the uh, Finnish Institute of International Affairs. And actually a similar uh, event was or debate was organized in, in Helsinki so yesterday, so it's interesting to hear the similarities and the differences on the on the, on the debate. And um, I'm actually very, very happy to, to, to welcome our... Uh, former um, the head of uh, Finnish Institute of International Affairs, Teja Tiilikainen, who, who is also the former Secretary of State in the mini Finnish Ministry for Foreign Affairs, and currently the, the, the director of the Center of Excellence on, on uh, tackling hybrid threats. Uh, Finland is a small country, and uh, Finland has always been a supporter of a uh, multilateral system and uh, including also the global role of the European Union. And uh, this is also uh, seen in our uh, presidency program. You know that Finland is, uh, is now chairing the, the Council of the European Union. And uh, actually, while we are sitting here, we also have a... Uh, at the same time, our heads of states are having a debate uh, in Brussels on the on the global role of uh, European Union when it comes to tackling uh, the climate change. And, and uh, Finland strongly believes that uh, the European Union can play an active role in the multilateral fora, especially when it comes to uh, trade and, and, and climate change and also human rights. And uh, I also strongly believe that uh, also the... European Union's strong role is also reflected in the uh, Commission's uh, new work program for the for the next year. But uh, I think it's time to get started. So uh, on my behalf, a uh, warm welcome to this venue. So welcome. Thank you very much, Ambassador. And I would like to. Uh, Invite uh, our speakers, uh, Teja Tirikanen, who has already been mentioned. Uh, uh, please uh, join me here uh, on the stage. Uh, Antonid Walkin, uh, my colleague from the European Council on Foreign Relations, expert on multilateralism, uh, MENA, and uh, human rights. And last but not least, Jerzy Baurski, um, director of the um, UN department um, at the Polish Ministry of Foreign Affairs. You, you, you chose this place. Uh, I'm now sitting in the middle. It's not... Uh, <laughs> 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 ah, you have followed the instructions. Very good. Uh, mm, I will start in Polish, uh, if you don't mind, and uh, then switch into English at some point and then back to Polish. Uh, państwo, uh... Ladies and gentlemen, we are meeting today to discuss the future of the liberal world order from the perspective of multilateralism and the roles of, of international organizations. And we are meeting just one or two days after the Court of Appeal at the World Trade Organization stopped its operations. It might be a technical remark. Now, it sounds very technical, for common people reading um, different press releases, this might be not all too, um, this might be not very interesting. However, this is a symbol of how a very important 
order within a very important instrument within uh, this World Trade Organization and the whole system of arbitration between states with regard to international trade. Well, that instrument does no longer uh, exist. This court should have mm, a number of members, at least uh, three, and right now this 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 court has just one member, which is not enough. It takes at least three judges to deliver a judgment in a case. So I think this is just a symbol of what is going on. It is a symbol of, of a crisis of the international order based on cooperation between states with the involvement of international organizations based on the structures that were established a few decades ago and have uh, become especially strong after 1989. And I can provide you with more examples of more similar... I can provide you with more similar examples. And we would like to discuss what this all means, what the consequences are for Europe, but not only for Europe, also for, for the whole world order. And what kind of a role the European Union might play as regards defending the international organizations or maybe co-shaping the world order, or at least part of it, at least part of, of, of these institutions and norms, rules. And there, were, there is a report on, on this issue, three crises and a chance, three crises and an opportunity, that's the title of the report that we have worked on. And in this report, we discussed what kind of interest the European Union has in the multilateral world order, in Europe's, well, Europe's stake in multilateralisms. And the authors of this report are Richard Gowen and Anthony Dworkin, one of them sitting next to me. And this report, well, was drafted because we were supported uh, by Finland. And I would like to start with the following question, which appears to be an obvious one. And I would like to address this question to Anthony Dworkin, because Anthony Dworkin has written about three crises of the world order. So why is it this the case? In the current world, we have... Mm, we need more and more that states and, and regions and businesses work together to find common solutions to international problems. And even though we need this even more than before, we face we are facing now uh, such crises with regard to this multilateral liberal order. So the first question is as follows. Anthony, where does this crisis come from? What are the reasons, the deep reasons behind this crisis? Is it on? Yes. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, and I'd like to start also by thanking the, the Foreign Ministry of Finland for supporting this project. Um, we began our investigation really with a preliminary conference in Finland at the beginning of the year hosted by FIA um, in the beautiful snowy circumstances of a retreat um, somewhere outside Helsinki and now we're coming to to conclude the project with our a final report. Um, so we began the this project by you know asking um, from the really from the perception that multilateralism is uh, you know, crucially important for the European Union and for EU member states. Um, Europe is is composed of, you know, small countries that are dependent on an open international system to flourish. And then the EU in itself, its way of working, um, its whole identity is very bound up with the notion of a kind of rules-based cooperation between countries. So the, the new president of the European Commission, um, Ursula von der Leyen, has talked about the need for a geopolitical 
commission a more geopolitical approach by Europe. But of course, Europe is not going to become a realpolitik actor. When we talk of a geopolitical approach, it's in support of a multilateral system. Um, and the re why do we need to do that? Why, how do we trace back this crisis? In our report, we identify what we see actually as three interlocking crises. And I should say, it's not, we don't think that the, the system is collapsing, but we see it facing a number of serious challenges. Um, and the first one we identify we call a, a crisis of power. That is to say, um, you know, as it was set up and evolved, particularly um, in the years since 1989, the multilateral system has always depended on strong support from the United States. And I think we now see a situation where the United States, first of all, has less, um, in any case, less power internationally, and at the same time is under this president, um, but a little bit going beyond him, I think, pulling back from international institutions, you know, whether it's the, the Human Rights Council, which the U.S. has, you know, been withdrawn from, or the, the World Trade Organization, as you mentioned, where the United States under President Trump has vetoed the appointment of judges to the appellate body. Um, in a number of ways, we see the U.S. stepping back, and at the same time, we see other powers um, you know, Russia to some degree, but most notably China, stepping forward to fill the gap. And so much more now there's a kind of competition within multilateral bodies, which is either preventing them from functioning, or in some cases they're, they're functioning, but perhaps the rules and values underpinning them um, may be somewhat different. So and that's, that's the first crisis. Um, you know, what is it going to continue to work without that American role? Um, what kind of values will guide the multilateral system and are they values that we share? Um, the second crisis linked to that is one of what we call a crisis of relevance. Um, you know, it is, of course, true, as you said, that the, you know, the most serious problems we face today are, appear to be issues that have to be dealt with multilaterally. But at the same time, the system that we have, in some cases, doesn't seem quite up to the job of dealing with them. So, you know, if you look at uh, an issue like, well, migration would be one case where I think there was a perception that the international system has not functioned effectively to distribute the, you know, the, the burdens imposed by migration. Um, another would be, say, development. It used to be that multilateral development agencies were really the key actors in the development sphere, but now... Um, we see a shift where, you know, either Chinese investment is much more significant or remittances sent by workers overseas are more significant. Um, and if you look at the Middle East and North Africa, the crises that we've seen in the last eight or nine years there, the war in Syria above all, you know, the multilateral system appears to have failed to, to really get to grips with these kinds of crises. So, and then, you know, new issues are emerging like cyber conflicts where the, the mechanisms and the institutions are not there. So that's the second one. And then the third crisis we see, again, all connected, is a crisis of legitimacy, a sense that the system that we have, is, you know, no longer can kind of claim the allegiance and support of all the groups and countries around the world that believed in it before. Um, so it, within the, the Arab world, there's a, you know, a strong sense of disillusionment based on part on what's happened in Syria. Uh, many African countries, I think, look at the UN system as something that's rather alien and you know, not so relevant to their conflicts. Um, we see other, you know, the Security Council, the membership of the Security Council appears out of date. And... Um, finally, I think also there's a kind of legitimacy within countries, within many democratic countries. You know, it used to be seen, I think, much more that multilateralism um, helped kind of pool the interests of all countries. And now there's much more of a sense that the kind of interconnections between countries could also be a threat or trade could be disadvantaging some sectors within our countries. Um, you know, migration might be managed in a way, again, that isn't seen as you know, adequately representing all interests. And so in the rise of kind of populist and national, nationalist political parties, we see evidence of the fact that the multilateral system has lost legitimacy, I think, in the eyes of some people. So that's the crisis. Yes. 
Thank you, thank you, Anthony. And, and, and a question, a follow-up question to um, to Theo on um, on the on these origins of the crisis of multilateralism, because Anthony talked about the crisis of power, crisis of relevance, crisis of legitimacy, pointing to also to some flows in the way how uh, the current international structures, international organizations, f has functioned over the last. Uh, a few years, and, and he said that uh, these organizations are no longer up to uh, um, the challenge of, of solving the, the, the problems. But maybe the real reason uh, or the main reason for the crisis of uh, multilateralism is uh, the end of a new unipolar world, that basically the multilateral structures uh, as we know them could function only under the American hegemony, uh, uh, as a liberal, benevolent hegemon, basically. And once we have a geopolitical rivalry now between China and, and the US, so this multilateral system is basically doomed to fail. Well, I, I think, uh, thank you, thank you for that question. Uh, I, I really think that it's uh, the fragmentation and challenging of this multilateral order uh, has its uh, origins in this uh, power struggle that we are having uh, between uh, when, where the, as, as Anthony writes in the, his report, uh, when the Western powers are, are, are becoming weakened, getting weakened, and the, and, and the number of, of, of rising powers uh, want uh, to challenge this order, uh, this multilateral order that they argue is based on Western values, Western leadership uh, that they they want to challenge, and along uh, the change, uh, along with the change that they want to see, they want also to to replace uh, uh, this order with its values and institutions, with a system that corresponds to their own values more, and 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 to their own kind of worldview. And here I want to, uh, to refer to two, two different types of order, orders uh, that, we, that we have seen in, 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 in the history of world politics. Uh, we have, uh, during the past few uh, decades, been experiencing a rules-based order, uh, which, uh, in my view, uh, balances uh, power differences between large powers and small powers. It tries to... Uh, uh, include some some uh, continuity concerning how states uh, and rules how for state state behavior uh, institutionalize agreements and so on and so forth but of course the alternative order is something that a couple of currently uh, rising powers would pre would prefer to have which is more based on agreements between large powers a kind of balance of power type of arrangements where, where the leading powers amongst themselves agree on the rules uh, which then need to be accepted by others. It's less multilateral, it reflects, uh, it's, it's re less rules based, there are less rules and more, more, more agreements between the, 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 the largest powers and the rest of the world then uh, have to adjust to this order. Uh, I'm afraid that we are moving more towards that kind of an order where the great powers uh, amongst themselves uh, agree on the rules uh, and, and, and these rules are not institutionalized into the form of, of, of international organizations or institutions as we have in the, uh, as, as the backbone of the, of, of the multilateral system. Uh, so this is this is really a concern, and, and I think you rightly point out that there is a power struggle, struggle of values behind. But also, also I agree very much. I, th I think it's not that black and white. What Anthony writes in his report that that also there are fields uh, in our current international life which uh, uh, the cu the current rules do not regulate. We have the we have the world of this technological development leading to a number of, of uh, issues that where we would need to have international agreements uh, and and the, the rules uh, would need to cover these these fields. So it's also uh, as as you write uh, a lack a lack of relevance in some fields of of of, of this order. But this this is. Uh, I'm quite pessimistic concerning the current development, and I and I think that the 
this uh, the challenging of the multilateral order also means that that we we are heading towards a, a different type of order we will uh, get back to this question what kind of order we are heading to and what could be Europe's role in, in designing it perhaps or co-designing it and now I switch into Polish and ask a question Jerzy Baurski który Jerzy Baurski who is the director uh, of uh, the department, department of uh, United Nations and human rights in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs but also insofar as the UN itself uh, He's in a situation of a diplomat who had uh, the opportunity to follow, to track, or to co-shape, really, very closely Polish policy as uh, a member of uh, the Security Council of uh, the United Nations Organization. And this is quite an interesting uh, um, perspective uh, uh, of looking at these three crises uh, from the point of view of the United Nations, how much uh, these uh, three crises, these three powers, forces, or mm, uh, 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 and, and this uh, mm, legitimation, le legitimacy, and relevance, how how does it fit with UN? How how you could present it shortly? Thank you very much for the invitation to the panel. And now relating to the questions, but also presenting just uh, some free thoughts after the two years of our membership in the Security Council, mm, I'd like to say that, of course, I fully agree uh, with uh, your uh, assumptions regarding the crisis of multilateralism. This is a fact. Uh, this is uh, because of the power struggle between the most important uh, powers of the world, policy of uh, Russia, China, to a certain degree also United States, European Union as the fourth uh, pole in that game, uh, well, the EU does participate in it. United Nations mirrors these tensions which are visible in the work of the uh, Human Rights Council or the General Assembly or the Security Council. All these tensions are mirrored. At the same time, it's true that the United Nations organizations created after the Second World War not fully fits to the today's reality and it's difficult to find a solution with regards to all these various tensions within these structures. At the same time we don't have much better structures, multilateral structures and probably it's gonna be long before we do have something like that. So, offensively, we say that we have a crisis and that this organization, to a small degree, is able to um, help with this crisis or, uh, in a pragmatic way, we try to approach it, to, to approach this reality and try uh, to um, tackle these problems. As a professional diplomat, I choose the second scenario, functioning in the conditions uh, which exist. Out of the positive aspects, I could say that inside the Security Con Council, the voice of the states of the European Union is heard very strongly, and we are coordinating our positions uh, uh, quite uh, strictly. Last year and this year, one third of the members of the Security Councils are the states of the European Union. These proportions and the uh, future years might deteriorate, but uh, for now this is quite a strong voice. And we have uh, our interventions that we present together in the sense that we organize press statements before the debates, after the debates, uh, uh, and uh, we agree upon uh, how to tackle the most important challenges uh, on the agenda of the Security Councils, the peace process, uh, Syria, Yemen, etc., etc., and this voice uh, is visible. How much are we able to impact uh, the decisions effectively? This is yet another matter. Very often, the, or the, the biggest failure of the international system 
is the Syrian crisis. Uh, the Security Council, the body responsible for peace and security, cannot is unable to find a solution. Why? This is the question mainly to the the big players. And inside the Security Council, we are unable to find a solution. Very often, resolutions were vetoed by Russia and China. Other crises uh, can't find um, a, a area for discussion in the Security Council because uh, the members of the Security Council, T5, um, do not allow the crises related to their national interests to be put on the Security Council agenda. A good example is the crisis, the Ukrainian crisis or the aggression of Russia on the Ukraine, despite of our attempts uh, uh, and endeavors, we were not really able to uh, draw the interest of the Security Council in this subject, uh, because they believe uh, that the Normandy format should take care of at or OSC. Uh, so uh, this is just my quick reaction. Uh, thank you. So far has been quite gloomy, to be honest. Uh, uh, so the, the, there is a crisis of multilateralism. The Security Council is not uh, fulfilling its uh, role as protector of the world's peace and, and order in, in, in the world. Uh, and uh, there is, as they uh, pointed out, there is not really uh, a, a good way out of this crisis. But uh, luckily, this, the, the title of, of the paper, uh, Anthony uh, uh, co-authored, uh, there are three crises, to be honest, but also there is one opportunity or an opportunity. <laughs> so uh, my question to, uh, to, to Anthony is to maybe to elaborate a little bit on this opportunity. And I can disclose that this opportunity uh, relates uh, very much to the role of Europe, right? I mean that the opportunity is for Europe to play mm, a more active role in the, in, in the defense of, of um, the Matlar, Matlar uh, liberal order. Uh, but of course it's not uh, so self-evident, so I think some explanation is, is required from, from Anthony to, <laughs> to tell us... Uh, to what extent and why, actually, perhaps, first of all, why Europe can, uh, can be um, instrumental in, in protecting this order. Thank you. So our, um, our report is carefully structured. So that we, at the beginning parts of the report, um, we give people the bad news um, and, uh, you know, make them very gloomy. And then for the second part of the report, we try to have a more positive um, spin, or at least to point out a, a possible silver lining to the, the bad cloud that is hovering over the multilateral system. And, you know, I would say that um, a couple of things that I think are, you know, are important to observe to begin with. First, um, although we talk about, uh, you know, the multilateral system and world order, um, it's probably helpful to think of it as a series of interlocking aspects of order, different institutions, different parts of the multilateral system. And I think, you know, there's more or less scope for, um, you know, more or less opportunity um, according to the different sections. And so I, that's one thing that we try to do a little bit in the report. And... The second thing is to, to pick up on the point that Taya made. You know, I think the, the competition, the power competition is real. And it's a, you know, it's a significant part of the world. And I think um, underlying all these um, you know, aspects of crisis that we think about is a, you know, probably a central dilemma, which is how do you have a, a system of rules for a world? We'd like to see a liberal world order. And yet the world now contains a large number of powerful countries that are not themselves liberal and that don't subscribe to liberal values. So how do you have a, you know, a rules-based order? How far can it be a liberal order if the countries are illiberal? And I think you know, one solution would be to say we should pull back, 
and we should have just one set of rules for the liberal world, um, and then you know perhaps beyond that it can be a competition for power. But I think that would be a mistake to go down that road. I think it's important to have a, you know a conception of order that can govern the the world as a whole. And I think you know many issues that we face don't fall neatly onto one side <clears throat> or the other. You know, climate change, for instance, being an obvious one. So. The role, I think, for, for Europe, coming on to your question, is to try and see on each issue, in each part of multilateralism, what scope is there for building a kind of international coalition or partnerships um, that are going to be effective in continuing to deal with this problem. And you know, the, the challenge for Europe is to look for these kinds of partners, and you know, Europe can't solve the problems on its own. But perhaps what Europe can do is to be a kind of convener, um, to be a, you know, a, a, a power which is a mobilizing power to build a coalition. Um, and here we come to what we see as the opportunity. And the opportunity is in a world where so much of what we see is the United States and China threatening to divide the world between them or to use international forums and institutions for their kind of um, attempt to confront each other, we see a lot of countries that don't want to either subscribe fully to you know, the, the vision of America under Trump, of a kind of rather bilateral power-based approach, or the vision of China under Xi Jinping, which is perhaps a, you know, a world order uh, with Chinese characteristics, you know, one could say, um, with a very statist approach, um, not much attention to human rights, and so on. So we think there's a lot of areas where Europe can, can find um, a group of people. Uh, when we presented in New York, the uh, Finnish ambassador to the United Nations spoke of a silent majority of countries that didn't want to fully be in the camp of one or the other. Um, and I think Europe is well-placed to try and mobilize those coalitions. It's well-placed partly because you know, it's, it's more neutral. Um, it's not seen as pursuing so much its own agenda. Um, and it's also the other aspects of the opportunity that we identify. You know, Europeans are kind of skilled and experienced at working in multilateral fora. You um, gave the example of the Security Council and the degree of European influence there. Um, you know, if you look at the General Assembly, um, there's a strong record, we say 80%, according to our research, of UN negotiation processes in re recent years have had European countries as either conveners or co-conveners. And the third area where, you know, where we see an opportunity is in the ability to innovate. If the, if the multilateral system is perhaps a little bit out of date, um, European countries and the EU are showing their ability to to innovate, to work in more flexible ways, uh, whether it's the inventions of new formats like the Alliance for Multilateralism or you know, the Paris Peace Forum or um, the, in cyberspace, the Paris call for, for cyberspace. You know, so you know, we see scope for new, new kinds of, um, you know, new flexible ways of working and new kinds of coalitions. And I think we could... You know, if you look, for instance, at the Human Rights Council, maybe we could talk about that in more detail. You can see how some of this kind of coalition building is is bringing some results. Yeah, thank you, thank you, Anthony. And, and a question to Taya, because uh, Anthony t talked about how uh, Europe can build coalitions, um, and uh, we have an alliance of multilateralists. Um, 20 countries subscribe to that and uh, apparently is one of the key european initiatives in, on the on the on the um, international stage uh, pushed very much by by uh, germany and, and france but i wanted to ask you about the other side i mean about the challengers of of this multilateral order because we have um, uh, anthony mentioned uh, or you mentioned also several times and the issue uh, Russia, China, United States, as those countries uh, which basically challenge the current structures, current order. But clearly they do not pursue a, a common line. I mean, they have diverging interests and diverging um, uh, perspectives also on, on how the current system functions. Could you perhaps elaborate a little bit how you see the role of the three 
big sort of I don't know if you want to 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 call all of them uh, challengers of the of the current order, but but how they uh, first of all, what are their motivations and what are their goals? Do they have a, a alternative plan for 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 a multilateral order, and and can they perhaps uh, be also partners of European Union on certain issues, maybe? Uh, so that we can basically have a sort of a pick and choose approach, also to 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 and, and variable geometry <laughs> when it comes to the cooperation in, in defense of Mustafa Uh When we talk about Russia, China, and and the U.S., I think we we talk about three very different countries when it comes to their perspectives uh, and strategies for the uh, for the a, a possible uh, international order. Uh, they have they they have all, uh, their own national approaches and and the, the 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 good thing from a european point of view is that they they don't share their views in particular russia and china because they have currently found each other uh, and 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 constructed a kind of uh, some kind of, of strategic coalition where the uh, where the unifying thing is the, uh, the a common enemy picture uh, or, or that they want to challenge a U.S.-led world order, but uh, uh, it's it's very difficult to see any uh, anything more or or, or very much uh, a, a common strategy uh, on the top of that. Uh, so China clearly, uh, as an economy of a, of a highly different uh, type than uh, than Russia, is also dependent on on global stability. China is dependent on 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 the world order that it criticizes and challenges. So this is this is one could say the Chinese dilemma. Uh, it, uh, it it cannot go to very very far with this challenging as it would would crucially affect its its uh, economy, uh, which is, which, which uh, needs uh, rules and, and 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 stability. Whereas Russia, as a smaller economy, uh, is is. Uh, not in, in in such a position. It's uh, uh, one could say that it it's it doesn't present a, a, a an alternative uh, order, uh, but it, uh, it it it's critical of of the current one and the position of the U.S. and and seeks the support of China for 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 this 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 uh, approach. Uh, but I think the Russian worldview is more related to. Uh, what I, I described in my first uh, intervention. So it would like to see a world uh, consisting of a concert of a couple of powerful states, and it, it of course, uh, counts itself to this concert, concert of powerful states which would then uh, make agreements uh, and, and, uh, and, and rule the world uh, as, as one did in the 19th century. So it's, it's quite far from a, 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 any, any type of a multilateral order. Whereas I think the U.S. is, of course, a, an ally uh, still, uh, even if it's uh, it, with this regime, it's quite different. Its approach to, towards uh, the uh, multilateral order is quite different from the European one. But, but it is also a highly divided society and country. So, of course, there are constituencies and, and groups of people that would rather see a, a world uh, like the one uh, we used to have <laughs> with, with uh, a strong set of international institutions and rules. So, so clearly, yes, to answer to your question, if, if, uh, what are the possibilities for, for, for Europe and, and the EU to look for allies uh, among these, uh, these, these powerful states, uh, I think uh, uh, and agree with Ant Anthony that there are clearly fields uh, of, of international rules and, 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 and norms uh, where, where Europe and, and the EU could cooperate with, of course, with the United States, uh, but, but also with China uh, and, and, and other actors. But I want to uh, make one, one further observation that we haven't discussed yet. There are also other powerful actors in the world than, than, than states. So we have, a, we have a highly fragmented world also in this respect, that there are, are different types of non-state actors that are, 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 are being empowered. So we have all from large companies uh, to civil society 
uh, organizations, uh, also of course uh, criminal organizations <laughs> which use their possibilities. Uh, but uh, in many fields of international regulation, for instance, uh, it is perhaps more this world of non-state actors that the EU should like to or, or should try to partner with and look for partners than 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 within uh, within the world of, of state actors. There might be more common interests there. And, and uh, so, so clearly the EU should, should look around uh, towards uh, all types of possible, possible allies. Uh, but to conclude, I think that uh, the transition that we are experiencing for the time being, power struggle and, and uh, the transition from a, uh, a Western-led international order to, to something else, I think it's it's very diffi uh, difficult for 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 me to 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 foresee where what exactly is 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 the Chinese long term a uh, longer term goal concerning uh, the order that it would like to see as it's as it's partly dependent on this order that it still would like to challenge. Thank you very much. I will switch into uh, Polish again, but uh, follow up on, on your uh, recent remarks also on, on China and um, ask uh, Jerzy the following question. Uh, These are actually two questions. We were talking about the big players who are now challenging, challenging this multilateral world order. And these big players... They all have their own interests and their own approaches. And now, coming back to the United Nations, to what extent is this political game visible on UN level? And when we are talking about China, well, to what extent would you see China as an entity destroying the system? Or maybe China is a country that is trying to take over the control over those international organizations within this UN uh, order. And Anthony was referring to this example of uh, choosing the head of uh, FAO, F-A-O, and a Chinese uh, person became head of FAO, even though there were different candidates from France, for example, and you also know this Human Rights Council or a committee where China was again able to force its own solutions. So what does this strategy of those big players look like from the inside? And my second question, to what extent can we reform this system? When we are talking about the role of the European Union, Europe, is there any space within this UN order for some reforms. This might be a rhetoric question, but I still want to ask it. Maybe there is space, maybe there is room for some deeper changes initiated by the European Union. Thank you very much. Well, I would like to sound more optimistic this time than I did before, so I will be looking for positive things for what... Um, well, it's like a common area for us and not a dividing one. We cannot say that all these challenges, the US, Russia, China, that these are like things we can treat together. Not really. USA, well, this is our like-minded partner in very many issues, also in many areas. This is a partner for us that we value a lot and that we need a lot. And the member states of the European Union, well, we need to take care of our relations with the US, even though they're are some challenges involved in this in these relations of course but in terms of values i think the us say are a, a great partner for us and we are really, really like minded now as regards china this is obvious again china is taking its opportunity because the us say are stepping back and now there is space that can be taken over by China. There are 15 specialized agencies of the UN and four of them are led by Chinese people. And these are new officers like FAO and ICAO, UNIDO, 
Unido, and a fourth one, I, I've forgotten the fourth one now. And just to compare, France, the uh, Great Britain and the US, all together, they also have four uh, people leading these specialized agencies, so just as many as China. And China is contributing more and more money to this system. It's just the USA that pay even more. And uh, the Chinese contribution uh, as regards financing peace actions uh, has increased dramatically, like a few times. This is, of course, a positive effect because China is able to stabilize different regions in which we now have conflicts. But, but all these examples show clearly that China is now trying to make its voice heard within this multilateral system, and successfully so. China is able to make friends with the developing countries, the G77 group, but well, there are in fact 120 countries involved in that group, so these are the countries we referred to as developing countries. Um, in the past, and now we call them the countries of the South, where these um, countries are very sensitive as regards what China is saying, uh, as regards the right uh, to, of development, all these cultural rights. These are very important aspects for these developing countries, and China is able to make friends of them. And if you have the support of some 120 countries uh, in the UN, you can pass any resolution you, you want, uh, both in the General Assembly and in all these different um, agencies. But this does not mean that we should not work together with China. To the contrary, we should look for common positions with China as far as this is possible, because the Chinese diplomats have usually this pragmatic approach, and thanks to this pragmatic approach taken by the Chinese diplomats, it is very often the case that we are able to convince our Chinese colleagues to work with us. And another thing, you were talking about the position of the European Union within this multilateral order, well, it will depend on how successful the European Union is at creating coalitions. This is crucial for many international initiatives. If you want to be successful in this respect, you need partners, and you can find them in Africa or in Latin America, for example, or in the Arab world. Well, that depends on the topic. So depending on the topic, you can find partners in different regions of the world. Let me give you one example. The European Union, together with Latin American states, uh, is now working on a resolution regarding children's rights. Uh, and this is a, a very good initiative taken on the UN level. And it is really successful, and we have great cooperation with Latin American countries. Now, uh, the Arab countries, again, we are able to work with them in a significant number of aspects. And some years ago, we thought, well, how could we talk about human rights with the Arab countries? Well, you can. In some areas, you can. So depending on what kind of initiatives you are working on, you can find partners in different regions to make sure that the voice of the European Union is heard. And my last remark, I think for almost all the member states of the UN, it is important for the international law to be observed, especially for small countries, all um, medium countries, which are the majority, of course. They want to make sure that the international law is obeyed. So I'm quite optimistic. And one more example of something that has been a successful project recently. In May 2019, there was a resolution adopted by the General Assembly. We established an international day of uh, victims of violence on religious uh, grounds. And for this initiative, we invited, we created a core group of countries promoting this initiative. 
and we invited countries from all over the world to join the SCORE group promoting this initiative, and the resolution was adopted. It was a consensus, a, a consensus decision, and we have now, now we now we have this international day commemorating the victims of violence on religious grounds. And of course, you can ask, how important is this? Well, it is important, I think, because it shows that we can take common initiatives together and we can make alliances based on international documents. Thank you. Uh, pick up on this uh, point on on this dynamic coalitions or variable geometry as uh, m when it comes to these multilateral actions uh, and perhaps raise the level of optimism even more in this discussion because uh, Anthony and Richard in in their paper identified a, a number of uh, areas policy areas where European Union could uh, take action and be according to them efficient in forging this kind of uh, cooperation on the matter level in order to mm, achieve certain certain goals and maybe this is the right moment to turn to this uh, part of your paper and and say a few words uh, where do you envisage this potential for for the European Union to be the leading power when it comes to the um, this kind of efforts yeah um, absolutely you know I I kind of really agree with the, the points that you were making and I think it would be you know it would we shouldn't um, reject the involvement of countries like China that want to be engaged and support the system but at the same time you know where we have a vision that's different from theirs we should regard it as a, a kind of you know a competition that we engage in you know with optimism and with the sense that we can win support and I think you know there are there is obviously a, a lot of solidarity among countries in the global south as you say but equally you know i think there are countries that are concerned about the the danger of chinese domination in africa um or in the un that are concerned about the kind of uh, rather aggressive approach perhaps of china on budget matters um and so in all these different areas i think there is scope to to look for partners um so on the you know on the question of human rights you gave some examples of our ability to work with islamic countries for instance um, myanmar was one question where the eu has been able to get resolutions approved um in the human rights council on on myanmar um you know obviously where china would oppose them but where they've been able to succeed by building on alliances with with other Islamic countries. Um, Venezuela would be another case where by working with Latin American countries, the EU has been able to, um, to be successful. Um, you know, it's, I think in the area of trade, um, here the, the EU is a sort of significant global power because of the size of our market. Um, and it may be we're in this world on trade where um, the United States at the moment is very unhappy with the World Trade Organization partly because of the, um, the way that it treats China. So China has an economy that's very differently structured, um, you know, with a heavy role for state subsidies and state-owned enterprises and uh, forcing companies to transfer technology. Um, and those concerns are shared also by, by Europe. Um, but Europe would like to solve those problems within the trade system rather than adopt the approach of the U.S. to turn its back on the WTO system. Um, similarly, China, I think, has a strong interest for, you know, exactly the reasons you said, in the persistence of a global trading system. Um, there may be some sense in which the U.S. and, and China are decoupling, um, but China does not want to pull back completely from the world trade system. And so there may be scope for Europe to, to be a kind of go-between that works with the Chinese to perhaps reform some of the ways they engage with the system, perhaps on greater transparency, and perhaps work with the United States to say, if China is addressing these issues, then let's work with you to come back into the WTO and perhaps start up the um, dispute settlement system again. Um, so that would be one, another possible way, you know, slightly different approach in a different area. And the third that I would mention is, is the question of cyber, which again is going to be a 
you know, really a kind of crucial issue in the world ahead. And here I think we already see the way that Europe has established itself as a, a kind of global standard setter. Um, so the, um, the GDPR, the General Data Protection Regulation passed by the EU, um, which gives greater privacy rights in respect to data, has been adopted by many, many countries around the world as a kind of gold standard. Um, you know, even though they're not formally bound by it, they look to the EU and say, yes, you are a credible source of standards that do protect rights in this area, you know, and that do find a third way between what might be a free market American way led by the corporations and a very state-driven Chinese way that perhaps is not respectful of rights. So, you know, that would be, that would be a third example. And it's exactly in that area where the kinds of coalitions that you talked about that reach out to corporations and civil society groups and cities, you know, that kind of innovation, I think, where there's a role for that. So, you know, I hope I'm contributing to the sense of optimism. Um, you know, some areas are going to be harder. Um, and some of the, you know, for instance, conflict and post-conflict situations like Syria. I think we have to accept that, you know, whatever settlement is found in Syria, it's likely to be something that we're not very uncomfortable with. Um, but in other areas, I think we have the influence and the ability to, to pull countries you know, towards a, a point of view that we're happier with. So yeah, I would, would like to uh, pick up on, on Anthony's point on cybersecurity, because you were uh, cyber, or not only security, but the, the whole digital area, uh, and because you are, you are working uh, in a, at a new, I mean, you are not just working, you, are <laughs> you have established and, and uh, you're heading the, uh, you're chairing the, um, uh, the, the, the center dealing with hybrid threats, uh, the center which is uh, part of the EU-NATO cooperation uh, in this area. And uh, Anthony uh, said, uh, based in Helsinki, and uh, this is also one, uh, along with with climate uh, policy, one of the priorities of Finland, uh, as I, as, uh, if I understand correctly, um, when it comes to this global um, agenda. So my uh, my question is, if you could perhaps elaborate a little bit more on uh, on on this dimension of multilateral cooperation, to what extent you see. Uh, European Union, but also perhaps some member states like Finland as, as drivers of, of a, because uh, of a new you know sort of dimension of the multilateral order in, a, in an area which has, uh, has not yet been covered by, by multilateral arrangements. So do you think Europe could indeed be a, a trigger of, of a basically new multilateral system? Uh, or um, because of the fact that we are, you know, when it comes to tech and and we are not really the the superpowers um, in, in the world. So there are others who, who could theoretically have a stronger impact. So how do you see that? Uh, uh, thank you. I, I think uh, that the phenomenon of hybrid threats uh, we, with which we refer to uh, non-conventional threats against uh, societies. So we know that uh, great powers have exerted or tried to exert influence. They have always, always done it. So this influencing other states is nothing new. But when it comes to the means uh, of, of influencing, uh, this is where we come to, to hybrid. So, so this phenomenon deals with influencing and exerting power with, with non-conventional means, uh, affecting uh, uh, elections or influencing elections, public debate, uh, critical infrastructure, and, uh, and functioning uh, within, as we say, in the gray zones between war and peace. Uh, so this is a kind of, uh, even if it's an old phenomenon, the, the new ways of, of also uh, taking advantage of this uh, technological development because this cyber means information technology is also an instrument uh, in the hands of someone that wants to uh, exert influence in another state, within a state. So we are dealing with a, a very complex phenomenon that I think partly has its roots in this uh, situation which, which is uh, described in this report. When the rules of international behavior are, are no longer respected, it leads to, to increasing distrust uh, between uh, st states and uh, provides room for maneuver for these, these kinds of phenomena. 
so so when it comes to uh, uh, dealing with or what what uh, your question how can we cope with this phenomenon do we need uh, new rules yes partly new rules in those fields where uh, these possibilities uh, of exerting influence are now being used because the set of rules uh, either does not exist or is not respected and and the cyber space is belongs to these fields where 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 the, the rules are only uh, in the making or if if there, there are rules they are not necessarily followed uh, but also partly, I think uh, uh, it's 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 partly also a que question of of lack of of trust, uh, which is which can be uh, linked with this transition of of power of the power struggle that we 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 are uh, witnessing. Uh, the more there is conflict about values, the more more there is uh, suspicion uh, within the international system the more there is also room for maneuver for for hybrid influencing so uh, so so this is this is the way uh, i see it yes europe could be a a uh, a, a, a strong actor there uh, when it comes to not only shaping rules but also uh, increasing uh, trust between between uh, different actors Working, promoting multilateralism is also a tool there, uh, but but uh, it, it's it's quite a it, it, it is a tricky situation. I want to raise one uh, apart from uh, uh, separately from this hybrid thing. I want to. Anthony was positive. You were you were optimistic, and I also want to be an optimist. I want to see a greater role for the European Union, but still I want to raise because I, I feel I need to do that one field w w where we need to be worried and concerned and 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 where i un uh, unfortunately think uh, the eu uh, it's difficult for the eu to to play a, a leading role and and this is of course arms control uh, because uh, there are different fields of 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 uh, of international rules that are, are currently not being being respected, but when it comes to this core field of of, of arms control or the use or, or rules for the use of for, force prevention of, of crises, that's that's where we go to the heart of 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 the international system, and that's where we need to be to be worried uh, uh, about the current uh, circumstances where th where one could say that the entire system of arms control that was built up during the cold war era uh, is either has collapsed or is about to collapse and and there my question would be that I even if the eu is not a, a a strong actor traditionally in this field as it has not been a part in these negotiations as these this the, this tends to be a system between great powers. Could the EU still <laughs> play a role there in order to promote the way back to a rules-based situation in this very, very uh, important field of, of, of international politics? Yes, thank you very much, Thea, for, for pointing to this very, I think, extremely important, important issue. I'm not sure if we... Uh, we'll be able to answer your question uh, here, but uh, I will turn to to uh, Jerzy Bawulski with with uh, before I give you also an opportunity to ask uh, some questions. Although we have um, just fifteen minutes left, uh, um, If we look at the last two years of Polish membership in the Security Council, uh, NATO. I would be interested in, in uh, United Nations organizations, I'm sorry. Uh, I, I would be interested, to, what was the moment when Poland or the international uh, community should have the feeling that the system has uh, completely failed? Was it a moment like that? Uh, and on the other hand, uh, where there was a really real success. So someone could say that uh, 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 that the Security Council, UN Security Council or the UN itself was uh, really worthwhile. Could you uh, mention two extreme situations? I'm sorry, this is a very journalist type of a question, but uh, please try to answer. Thank you. Uh, 
Well, the question is difficult. This is why I'm not going to speak for a long time, especially because I expect questions from the audience. Uh, uh, this is just half-jokingly. Uh, there's uh, no doubt about the fact, uh, what I've mentioned at the beginning, that uh, the lack of uh, uh, action of the international community insofar as this conflict in Syria is the greatest failure. The, the scale of the humanitarian crisis is known to us all. The fact that we are unable to find a solution is extremely painful uh, and I'm going to say that for a diplomat who is working in the Security Council, this is once again, uh, this is even more painful because debates about Syria are happening uh, more or less every two weeks in th three different uh, areas, political, humanitarian and chemical weapons. And for two years we have functioned in this system, participating in the debates, uh, having interventions. And when we compare what we write, those interventions, what we're writing now in December with what we have been writing uh, two years ago, this is more or less the same. So I cannot find any justification uh, for the entire international community. Uh, uh, this is my personal feeling. I'm sorry, but I'm, I'm, I'm really disgusted uh, by that. In so far as uh, you and function. Undoubtedly, peace operations of the UN, this is a success. We don't speak much about it because the UN uh, peace uh, operations uh, have a stabilizing function in Sudan or in the Middle East. Uh, maybe we do not uh, know about it because we don't read it in the news on the television that there is something happening in the Sahel. There is a peace uh, uh, operations which is stabilizing the situation. If there was uh, a big conflict happening in that area, then we would hear about it and then we would ponder it. In many aspects, this activity of uh, Peace Corps, uh, I think, and, and peace missions, uh, uh, I think that, that blue helmets uh, sh should be recognized for what uh, they do. And uh, here I go to, the, to Poland. Last month, Poland, after 10 years, has uh, been reintroduced into the peace operations. 250 soldiers are in UNIFIN mission in Lebanon. It took us 10 years to understand as Poland, as government, that this is necessary, that this is needed, that this strengthens our credibility, our reliability as an actor on the international forum. When, when we speak in a Security Council, if we don't want to uh, to be uh, just uh, treated as someone who speaks and not acts, we need to participate in peace operations. And I'm very happy that thanks to the uh, commitment of uh, the President Andrzej Duda, this is successful and our... Uh, uh, mm, and we are included in these operations, and I hope that it's going to be broad. And thank you very much. Thank you. Now we still have some time for some two questions, I think, from the audience. I've got one person who wants to ask one question. Does anyone else want to ask a question? We can accept two questions. My name is Wilczek. Can you hear me well? I am both Polish and Swiss. And I studied in Switzerland, in the city of Geneva, and I, well, had lunch with different ambassadors and participated in different conferences. I think the university I graduated from is the best one you can imagine. However, I think the institution we are talking about, the UN, is not effective. It's like the life of a human being. There is a starting point, and then you just need different generations. So now the time has come for a new international generation that would ensure peace all over the world. And my proposal is to create a new competitive international organization, such which can give a peace guarantee for the entire world. And my research says that the best instrument to maintain peace with efficiency and um, instrument which is well organized and uh, has a power of action, are military. So my proposal is to create an international organization of military leaders to guarantee white peace, whose objective is prevention of conflict, prevention of war, but not killing each other. 
that means to jump to high level of self-organization of all humanity. That means a high level of civilization and culture. And that's when we achieve this target, everything will be solved. That's, that's a very courageous proposal. Uh, 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 I promoted Stumble. I came just yeah. So we will um, have an opportunity to, to, to hear the response from the panel. Uh, uh, is there any other uh, question, uh, Mr. Topic? And then uh, Mrs. Kowalski. Well, I must say, I would like to congratulate on, on the choice of, of the topic of um, this debate. This is really uh, an important issue. However, this notion of the crisis of the multilateral world order, I'm not sure whether this is a, a, a an accurate description of what is going on. I think we do have some problems in terms of the functioning of the world order. Yes, but is it a crisis? Well, we have great superpowers, they have their interests, and this has always been a problem for the UN and other the international organizations, so this has always been a problem, and that's why those superpowers have the veto right um, on the Security Council. And now the great success of this multilateral world order within the last 70 years, well, it is huge. Um, not just the peace operations or the development of human rights or humanitarian aid, these are fundamental changes that have taken place over the last 70 years, and it would be really difficult to, dim to imagine that this system could collapse, you know. Maybe we need to analyze it a little bit more, but I wouldn't say that there is a crisis. I think this goes too far. And my second point, or my third point, actually... This international order, it is not about interests of the superpowers. It is a matter that is decided by almost 200 countries that have an interest in maintaining this world order. So when we are now talking about how the system could be strengthened or how we could solve the problems that we are facing in this regard, I think the European Union could play a very important role. However, to have this role, the European Union needs to mobilize all the other countries that are members of the UN. And now to sum up, I would like to suggest that maybe we could organize an event to discuss about how to strengthen this international world Order. So one last question. This is really a question, not a comment. We can accept it because we need to be done by um, 4.30. I would like to have, I would like to ask the following question. The crisis we are facing in Europe, and especially the countries of our region, this is a humanitarian crisis because we have well the population in 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 Africa and in Asia in the Arab countries is, is increasing it's an increase by 4% so the population of those region could could double within a few decades and this does not go hand in hand with the European liberalism. And my question is, how can the international organization respond to these growing populations in all those regions I've mentioned? Perhaps uh, in the reversed order, if you, if you want, if if uh, if you want, of course, to, to take the floor. Dziękuję bardzo. Thank you. Well, referring to question number one. I would be very realistic in, in this regard. And I think this, this idea of destroying the current world order, which is based on the UN system in order to, 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 uh, to, to take this attempt to, to, to create something totally new, I think this is not realistic and I will not recommend this to Minister Chapotovic. I'm sorry. It is a fact also that those five countries that have the veto uh, right, they will not give it up. 
They have the veto rights and they are not going to give it up. They don't want to even talk about it. Within the UN, we are discussing about reforming the Security Council. This debate has been taking place for some 20 years so far and I'm sure it will keep taking place for another 20 years. I think that some things might be amended. Now the mic is not working properly, so we cannot hear the speaker. As regards... Well, Mr. Ambassador... Topic things that... The notion of, of a crisis might go too far. Well, and I could agree with him, because it is indeed natural for the world to have different stages. Some of them are better, some of them are worse, also in terms of international cooperation. So we might be now indeed in the stage of some challenges or problems. However, I agree that we should respect this great success of the UN that has taken place within the last decades. And indeed, uh, we just do not talk so much on a day-to-day -day basis about how much humanitarian uh, aid is provided by the UN worldwide every day. And now the demographics. Well, I think... Uh, it indeed contributes to this migration we are experiencing, not just in Europe. There are migration problems in all the continents. And I think that we should establish a, a dialogue between all the countries where these people are coming from and all those countries where they are where they want to arrive, but this is a very sensitive issue in political terms. In Europe and in Poland, it is like a topic that that can be very sensitive in political terms, and it might be difficult to find a constructive solution given this political pressure and political sensitivity of, of this issue. So it's quite difficult for me to sound optimistic in this regard. Thank you. Two minutes. Yeah. <laughs> I find the first question uh, very challenging. Uh, whether uh, concerning what kind of an uh, of an international institution or, or system could uh, prevent future crises and, and conflicts? W could we have a more efficient system than than the current uh, UN system, where the permanent members of the Security Council are are using their veto powers? And 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 uh, and, and uh, uh, also limiting uh, or constraining possibilities for for uh, co conflict resolution in those conflicts where they have a a, a, a huge national interest. Uh, there was one model proposed. Uh, we have uh, different models from from uh, earlier early, earlier earlier phases of our history. Uh, I think uh, as as. As long as we are committed to, to the principle of state sovereignty, uh, it, it becomes a very tricky question uh, to establish a system uh, if, if we want to respect state sovereignty by means of which we could uh, uh, then exert influence or in, in a state or against the state uh, also, also uh, without, without its, its consent. Because this this is the question, as I see it. But but I think it's it's perhaps the, the biggest question that we have in our current international system. What kind of a system should be established to effectively uh, prevent crises and uh, and the use of use of, of violence? Uh, but but uh, but I I, I and very briefly about the second question. I think that uh, unfortunately, what uh, what I perceive. Is, is a challenging of the multilateral system. If we think 20 years back, uh, our, our multilateral institutions and, and norms uh, were respected, uh, rules complied with uh, to a much larger extent than what is being done, uh, th done, done today. We also had a clearer, clearer, clearer leadership for, for that multilateral order. Uh, I hope we could get back to that situation, but for the time being, it, it looks quite gloomy. Thank you. Thank you. I, so I'll start with the, the second question. And, you know, I think you're you are right to say the system is not collapsing. 
Um, and we tried to make that point also in the report. You know, whether one calls it a crisis or not, but it's not, as we say, it's not like the, you know, the 1930s and the collapse of the League of Nations. Countries aren't pulling out of the United Nations Security Council. Um, the system is reflecting. I think the system is is under stress, and it reflects, uh, you know, an, a significant change in the international order. And I think what we see is a period of of adjustment. And the question is, what kind of institutions and what kind of order will emerge, you know, reflecting a different balance of power in the world and a different series of issues that are coming to the top of the international agenda. And, you know, that's very much is a, is a challenge that's putting the system under strain. And I think, you know, the, the question for us is how to respond to that in a way that best suits Europe's interests and preserves Europe's values as far as possible um, and preserves the idea of, you know, a rules-based system. Um, on the first point, I'm sorry to be also somewhat realist, um, but I think, you know, I'm also skeptical that, uh, you know, I think that the system which tries to uh, um, link the use of force to the balance of power in the world is probably an essential starting point. And, you know, like today, I think we're not ready to move away from uh, principles of sovereignty at this point, I think the, the result would be greater disorder, probably, rather than greater order. But I'll end by, you know, maybe linking all three questions. And what I think is a, a plausible way forward is the development of additional kinds of ideas of codes of conduct. Um, you know, new forms of international agreement, either in cyberspace or to deal with migration um, or improving governance in areas with, you know, increasing populations. Um, it's the idea of of codes which, you know, exert a kind of voluntary adherence which rely on the pressure of non-state groups. And we see that a little bit in the climate area, you know, and that could be the sort of mobilization of coalitions to, to you know, to put pressure on governments and corporations on climate. Um, and similarly, one could see something similar in conflict um, and in governance. So perhaps that's one way to be optimistic looking forward. Thank you very much. I think this has been a really successful debate, not just uh, because we are now um, finishing just in time, but also I think that we have managed to discuss this uh, topic in a way that makes it clear that the problem we are facing is a serious one. However, there is still hope for the future. I don't know if this is optimistic enough for an ending of our discussion, but I think that we can see that there are some aspects which show that the European Union could influence the world order and that the institutions that we still have, like Mr. Ambassador Tofpe was saying, are not collapsing. They are just facing some reconfiguration that um, might um, take a positive ending in the end. They are not meant to fail yet. So thank you. I'd like to thank all the panelists and I would like to thank the uh, Ministry of Foreign Affairs of uh, Finland for supporting this uh, report co-authored by Anthony Dworkin and I would like to encourage you to read this report and I would like also to thank the Embassy of Finland for supporting us within um, organizing this event and I would like to wish you a Merry Christmas because I think there will be no further meeting uh, held here in this format until Christmas. Thank you very much.